Good morning, church. Nice to be back in this sanctuary. The sanctuary welcomes all those who are here to meet and to commune with God. And as you come into the walls of SSGC, we welcome you as friends and family. Um, the church feels a bit empty today, but if you are willing to do move forward, then we give some space to perhaps the latecomers who are coming. Now, SSGC um, is a very homely place where we come to meet not just with ourselves, but to meet with God. And as we reflect on the cross that's in front of us, we leave the things of the world behind us momentarily as we focus uh, on what matters most this morning, which is this relationship that you have with God and allow Him to speak to you. So as we come before that time of worship, shall we just close our eyes and uh, bow our heads in a time of prayer? Father Lord, we want to thank you for this day, O oh Lord, that you have given us this opportunity, this health that we can walk into the church, Lord, to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ and also to be in this upward relationship with you, O oh Lord. And Lord, as we come here, we ask that, Lord, you work in our life, that, Lord, you speak to us individually and as a community. And as we reflect of this um, vision and mission that you have placed in our life a lot, you help us see how can we move forward in 2024 more effectively, more, um, more in community also a lot. And as also we reflect on this one for one in one a lot that you have impressed upon the church leadership and that the leadership has now um, shared with us here in the congregation, O oh Lord. We ask, Lord, that you will help us see and help us understand, O oh Lord, what do you want us to do in this particular year, O Lord. And as we come before you in this posturing of worship, we ask, O oh Lord, that you work in our life, you speak to us, and that, Lord, you touch our heart, that each time when we move forward, we move forward as a changed person day by day, step by step, O oh Lord. And all this, Lord, we ask and pray, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Amen. Good morning, SSGC. Shall I invite everyone else to get onto your feet to join us in the time of singing and giving glory to God? Let's put your hands together. Sing let praise. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all its eyes. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name with the dark and it changes everything. We sing. We are when we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We see you break down every wall. We watch the giants fall. We cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever. All creation cried, God, we praise you. Break down every wall We watch the giants fall We cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lives in high With all creation cry God we praise Christ has done on the cross. Life 
is different. Freedom is new, is there for us. So let's sing this part together. This is what living looks like. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. Come on. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. We see you break down every wall. We watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when the God of breakthrough, the God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lives in high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. We see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side forever lives in high. With all creation cry, God, we sing, oh.
no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. This moment, let's take this time to say a personal prayer unto God. Whatever is on our hearts, let's. We ask that He will open up our hearts. Meet with us this morning. Shall we? Shall we meet with him? He stands at the door to knock. And one way that can bring order into our lives is when we come and bring true worship unto our King, that He remains seated on the throne. Exalt you. We exalt you. We exalt you, God. It's our resolve. We exalt you.
Yes, Lord. Because you are with us, we will not fear. Lord, we come into your presence remembering the moment that night when you were at the upper room together with the disciples. You knew you were going to the cross. You knew that a cup of suffering is upon him. You knew that you're going to bear the penalty of sin for all of us. Lord, we want to exalt you for what you have done for us. And we will not be afraid. We will believe in you. Lord, we recognize that even as we partake of the bread, symbolizing the body broken for us, how you have died for us, Lord, we recognize, O oh Lord, that our mortal borders, bodies are also breaking down. And for some of us here who are already feeling that brokenness in our body, that sickness that seems to haunt me, that uncertain thing seems to be all around me. But today, Lord, we are not afraid because you are with us. Not only are you with us, you have died on the cross and your body broken for us. Thank you, Lord. We want to exalt you. As we take of this bread, as we partake of this bread, O oh Lord, we recognize and remember what you have done. Thank you, Lord. We will focus on you, remembering you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand together, as we all stand together and partake of the bread, giving thanks unto our Lord. Let's partake of it, the bread together. Thank you, Lord. Not only were we reminded of your bro body broken for us, we are reminded of how your blood was shed for us. Lord, we recognize we are sinners. We recognize and acknowledge that we have rebelled against you. But we thank you that you have provided a way out for all of us. That whoever believes in him who puts the trust in Him and confesses our sins before Him, You forgive us. And as I allow this moment between you and God, with your eyes closed, asking the Lord to forgive us of anything that we have done against Him, He's always willing and able to forgive us. Lord, thank you for forgiving us. You have heard our prayers, Lord. As we partake of this cup, we want to thank you and praise you for what has already been done on the cross. This victory that is found in Christ. We give you thanks as we partake this cup. You may be seated. Morning, church. Once again. Morning, church. Um, blessed, blessed Sunday. Um, to those who are joining us online and to those who are here, we welcome you into this uh, family. Um, and uh, there's many things to be thankful for in life. And for today, we are thankful that uh, yesterday we celebrated a union of a marriage. And we want to say congratulations to Ron and T again. It's very joyful to see when couples come together 
you know, and uh, right after they are being busy and tired for one whole day, the next day they are in church again. It's really a joyous occasion. And with that, let, shall we just stand and um, wish each other a very good morning, a blessed morning, and perhaps also walk over and congratulate them if you have not done so. Glad to see happy faces. And as a challenge, as we were walking around, did we notice anyone new in church? Is there any new guests in church today? Yes. Who are they? Who are they? <laughs> Don't be shy, just raise up your hand. If you're new in church this morning, I see two hands there. The ushers will come over with a pack of uh, welcome gift pack for you, and we are glad that you're with us. Just stay back. Um, SSGC is always proud to serve good coffee. So do stay back and have a, you know, a chit chat. Get, let us get to know you better. So. Now today I have two announcements from the church. Um, one is the one for one in one. And if you have um, heard the pastoral letter as it was uh, delivered, this year we will be reintroducing the one for one in one. And for those who are not familiar with it, it's basically a church-wide uh, initiative to win one person for Christ in one year. One for one in one year. Now, as we introduce this initiative again, we want to encourage the church as a congregation to really put your heart and mind towards uh, this and how we are going to do it to be accountable to each and one. We would like you to be active in your cell group and if you don't have a cell group, I'm sure you have a small group that you're part of, whether it is your ministry group, um, or perhaps, if also none, then perhaps reach out to the person who has invited you to church um, and be accountable. So this is something that we want to um, really work on this year. It's a church-wide initiative, and we encourage everyone to be active. And if you do not have somebody to be accountable with, um, reach out to any one of us, um, in the church and we can always come together in prayer and to support each other um, as we win souls for Christ. So that's the first announcement. And second announcement I have is on the basic Christian doctrine. So that will be next Saturday and we will be starting on the topic which is the church. So I will encourage you to also sign up and come together as we learn together from the scripture uh, on what the church is, the purpose of the church, um, and the re-establishment of the church itself. So this title, topic on the church life, fellowship, worship, membership, evangelism, and so much more will be covered. Um, so do sign up in the link, and also if uh, you can't access the link, do reach out to the church office. We have a WhatsApp church office number to get in touch so that we can plan the logistics better. Uh, so that's the two announcements that I have this morning, and without further ado, I would like to invite the speaker, um, today to speak to us. Good afternoon, uh, brothers and sisters and friends. Uh, this afternoon, my sharing is entitled Transform Relationship, Master and Servant, or in certain Bible translation, it uses the word master and slave. And the scripture references is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. Before we continue, let's commit the time to God in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we can worship you. Lord, we thank you that you are our God, that a creator God that who created the universe. 
Lord, we thank you for this position that we are your children. And Lord, as we look into your words now, we pray that you speak to each one of us. Help us, Lord, to digest what you want to tell us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, before we start, I thought that it would be good that we'll read these few verses together. So perhaps as a count of three, we'll do that together. One, two, three. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their masters and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with them. Perhaps after reading this passage, you might wonder how the teaching of master and slave is relevant to us in this 21st century. Be honest, any one of you thought about that after reading this? What is the relevancy of slave and master to us, you know, in this uh, internet world? I mean, this passage, is it relevant to us today? Can be, yeah. Very good, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> right, I mean, the first time that I prepared this, when I read, I said, hey, what, what is the relevancy of this passage to us? I mean, you're talk, talking about slaves and masters, you know. Perhaps to gain insight on the relevancy of this passage, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9, we must understand the context of the book of Ephesians when it was written, what I call the book context, you know, and also the cultural and historical context of slave and master in the Greco-Roman world. That means the ancient worlds during that time. Hence, I would like to outline my sharing into three. The context of what we are looking at, then the transformed relationship as what these a few verses was talking about, and perhaps to draw some application from there. Let's look at the context. Perhaps, maybe most of you know, the, the primary purpose of considering context is to derive the correct meaning and intent of the author. In this case, Paul. What is the real correct meaning and intention when Paul wrote this uh, book of Ephesians? Uh, we'll look at that. And then after that, we will look at the overall context uh, 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 of this book, followed by the historical context and also the cultural context. The letter Ephesians was written to encourage believers in Ephesus, living in Ephesus. In his letter, Paul provides the framework of how his readers can follow and imitate the Messiah and submissively transform to a community of Christ. The letter can be divided into two sections uh, broadly. One section, the called theological section, that is Ephesians chapter 1 to 3. And in there, it explains about our position in Christ. And there are two key notes that I can you know, draw on it out. Number one is that Christ has reconciled all creation to himself and to God. That's number one. Number two, Christ has united people from all nations to himself and to one another in his church, the bigger church. Right? That summarizes this uh, 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 theological section. And chapter four to six is what we call practical section. That's, you know, Paul was trying to, 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 to teach how to live from your position now in Christ. So in these practical sections, uh, can be summarized into two points also. Number one is that Christians must live as a new person. The old has passed, now you're a new person in Christ. So Christians must live as a new person. Number two, if 
the gospel of Christ does not radically change our life, then it is not the gospel at all. A very strong point, yeah? I selected a few verses just to summarize Paul, Paul's key messages uh, addressing our position in Christ and how to live from that position. Uh, it's over there. So it says that as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You can, you, you, it sees that Paul uses the word prisoner of the Lord. In other scripture verses, it's used slave, the word slave over here. We, we are the prisoner for the Lord. And what should we do? We should live a life worthy of the calling. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And be imitator of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself out for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to us. That's where we have partake the Holy Communion to, to, to give thanks what Christ has done on the cross. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We submit to each other, not because of, yeah, the person is higher, you know. It's because of our reverence for Christ. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. On the position that believers are now living a new life of love as prisoners of, for the Lord, that are worthy of the calling as one body submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. On this context, as what I've said just now, on this context, Paul addresses in detail how to live as wives and husbands. Before it comes to slave and master, if you look, look at the book Ephesians, Paul starts to talk about wives and husbands, then children and parents, then only come to slave and master. So on this context that I've mentioned, that is where Paul comes to address slaves and masters. Uh, let's move on to the cultural context. For all this cultural context or the historical context, most of the information I took it from this book, written by this William uh, Westerman, entitled The Slave System of Greek and Roman Antiquity. In the first century, in the Roman Empire, it's kind of estimated the population it is about 50 to 60 million. That's the population of the whole Roman Empire. And one in five residents were enslaved. So imagine, that means there were about 10 to 12 million people were slaves in the whole Roman Empire. Just imagine that. And because one in five residents were enslaved, slavery was accepted as part of the Roman society it's because it's so common. Yeah? Therefore, it is necessary to understand the cultural context of slavery in Greco-Roman world. Uh, to understand who they were and why they were enslaved. In the Roman Empire, it was not someone's race or their skin color that determined whether one was slave. Slavery usually resulted in losing a war, for example, and that one was unable to pay a debt. In challenging economic time, someone could voluntarily submit themselves into slavery. Or a parent could sell a child into slavery to earn some money. Unfortunately, another way a child could become a slave is when an unwanted child who was left alone to die could be enslaved, is found alive. If someone sold them into slavery, they could regain their freedom once they fulfill their debt or their obligation. Other than economic reasons, one might submit themselves into slavery to become highly trained and educated. So, so you can see the, the, the kind of understanding of slavery in those ancient world. Yeah? So one can also become a slave so that they can be highly trained or be 
educated. So it's a very different understanding of slavery as what we understand slavery now. A person could even uh, uh, could own or acquire a slave either through the purchase from a slave driver, that's a term that they use it, uh, or through inheritance or through what described as home breeding. That was not mean that a child took over the status of their mother. You know? That's what we call home breeding. Many skilled slaves in the first century attained freedom and independence, and some could even become Roman citizens. However, their rights and treatments as slaves were determined by the legal system and their master's attitude and behavior. So kind of at the mercy of the legal system and also the mercy of their masters. You know, if the master behave good, okay, they treat the slave better. Yeah. Slaves in the Greco-Romans world have various positions within the economy. And whatever needed to be done was done through the work of slaves. Hence, it has been hard for the ancient society to function without the work of slaves. Um, because a slave will be kind of the electricity of the ancient world. You know, electricity like us, don't have electricity, everything kind of shut down, yeah? So the slave is like the electricity of the ancient world. So without the slave, they, they can't really function. In the greco roman world, slaves work in many sectors. Not as what we think slaves are, you know, only a very low, low, low job, you know, yeah? Very manual job. Uh, they work in many sectors, from working in the mines to physicians in the imperial palace. In addition, the Roman states had slaves who performed various municipal services. This is kind of a little bit high-class services, so to speak, which included maintaining the imperial properties and working inside the imperial palace. Therefore, any attempt to denounce slavery in the greco roman world would be very challenging. Right? It's so in the system already. Although slavery was ingrained in greco roman culture, Paul commanded those few and controlled by the Holy Spirit to treat their slaves as fellow Christians, brother and sisters. Slaves did not have many rights in the greco roman world. However, Paul challenged the cultural norm by giving the slaves right and protection from abuse. That's what we read in verse 9. Paul also told the slaves that they would receive an eternal reward, uh, written in verse 7, for whatever good things each one does. Paul treated the slaves with dignity and respect, and he challenged his readers to act differently than those around them because they are equal under Christ. Under Christ there's no slave, free or slave, all are treated equally. With this context in mind, as well I've mentioned, the whole book of efficient context, uh, the cultural and also the historical context, it gives us insight into Paul's perspective that gives the key in master and slave relationship is essentially about this relationship between workers and those they work for. So the, the whole passage of this slave and master, essentially, it is actually talking not so much of the structure of slave and master, but it's actually talking about the relationship between workers and those they work for. So in today, our 21st century, we call this employer-employee relationship. Are you familiar with this term, employer-employee relationship, those who are working? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So essentially, that, 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 that's, that's all about, all right? So hence, it is relevant, this passage to us today, because essentially, it is talking about employer-employee relationship, yeah? So probably that's clear your mind to say, hey, what is this slave and master kind of thing have to do with us today? I move on to look at the transform relationship in these few verses. Paul urged the believers in Christ living in uh, Ephesus to transform their master and slave relationship or their master and servant relationship. 
uh, verses 5 to 9 describe that transformation. By the power of the Holy Spirit, not our own strength, but the power of the Holy Spirit, that transformation is made possible. Uh, I will not go into the, the details of all this in view of the time. I mean, if you are willing to stay back for three, four hours, I can go through that. Uh, if not, I will just do a few highlights, yeah? Probably that, that will suffice for this round. I, the whole teaching from verses 5 to 9, I kind of summarize it in these two tables that explain what needs to be transformed, how to transform, and in that transformation, what are the bases that we use? What I call the yardstick and why we need transformation. In the transformed relationship, the role of a slave is to obey and serve the master. And the role of the master is to treat the slave well. What's the difference from the previous slide and this one? Anyone see the difference? Any difference? This one and this one. No different, right? From the bottom, no difference. You need a tighter difference, right? This one is the first century situation. This one is, is we call it internet world, right? Yeah? It's the internet world situation. But the content is the same. Just an employer, employee. So what it means is that it's relevant to us today, as far as that relationship is concerned, that employee is supposed to obey and serve the employer, right? And how do we serve? With, with respect, with fear, and with sincerity of heart. And uh, that's how we obey. And how do we serve? Wholeheartedly that we serve. And some people will say, so, you know, this, this is good enough. This is why wholeheartedly, but where it would be the yardstick? The yardstick will be when we serve wholeheartedly, it means that as we serve the Lord, not to people. That's what you mean by that. Right? Because different people have different yardsticks. So when we obey, how do we obey? As we obey Christ. And why we want to do that? Yes, of course, to win the favor. And more because we are a transformed person in Christ. Of course, the Lord promises the reward. Hence, we seize that relationship. Our reward is not so much from the employer, but actually from the Lord. And employer, how do you treat your employee? It's very interesting. It says that equally, yeah, equally or same as what? And do not threaten them. Uh, what would be the last thing? It's because all of us are one in Christ. Yeah? And, and most important, I think this is very crucial. And why? is because whether you are employer, you are employee, you have a same master. That's what written in verse 9. Who is the same master? Our Lord in heaven. So hence, though this exhortation was written in the first century, but it's equally valid in today, 21st century. I will do some highlights, but not going through in details every of these elements. Serve versus work. We are to serve wholeheartedly as if we are serving the Lord, not people. That's what that word told us. The word used here is serve, not work. I would wonder, do you know why? Why Paul never used the word work for your master? He used the word serve. Because the word work seems to imply a duty, a chore, or an obligation. However, the word serve portrays an unselfish act. Let me give you an illustration to, to il illustrate that. A fisherman goes fishing daily, early in the morning. And many would say it is hard work. You have to wake up very early, you know, go fishing, you know, a whole day in the sea and then come back. Right? Compared to a person whose hobby is fishing. Anyone's hobby is fishing? No one. 
No one. Oh, only Daniel. No one likes fishing. Uh. No patience for fishing, uh, probably. <laughs> Alright, let's uh, compare, compare to a person whose hobby is fishing. Let's say Daniel. He wakes up early in the morning, 5 o'clock. He drives two hours to his favorite fishing spot, to that particular river, and he sat there for hours. At the end of the day, Daniel will say, oh, I enjoy the fishing trip. Same activity, fishermen go fishing, Daniel go fishing because that's his hobby. Same activity. To one, it is hard work, but to the other, it is enjoyment. So what makes the difference? What makes a difference? Same activity. So what makes a difference? The difference is the attitude when performing an activity. I think that's the crux of it. Our attitude when performing an activity. The Bible asks us to serve as if we are serving the Lord. Our attitude to employment should be as if we are serving the Lord. That should be our attitude. If our attitude is serving the Lord and not our employers, I think we will do an honest, effective day job consciously every time, irrespective of the response from our employers. Simply it's because our rewards are from the Lord. We will find fulfillment in our job because there is a purpose. Yes, you, you might say that, yeah, we work because we have to earn some money to put food on the table. We have to pay our mortgages. You know, Marcus just bought a house. He have to earn money to pay his, you know, bank loan. Yeah? <laughs> and yeah, we have to earn money to pay, and to save for our children's education. Yes, we have to do all that. But however, if that is the only purpose, I believe in no time we will burn out. That's why a lot of us, they say, oh, I burn out. You know, wow, boring. Huh? The same work, boring. Huh? You know? But if our purpose is to serve the Lord, the Holy Spirit in us will provide us strength because we are serving the Lord and we will find fulfillment in serving the Lord. Next one, do not threaten. The Bible says that employers are to treat employees in the same way and do not threaten them. As I prepared this, I was wondering why Paul used the word do not threaten instead of right, don't mistreat your, your, the slave or don't, don't treat them well or treat them fairly or treat them gently. Why do why you use the word do not threaten them? This exhortation is a very key management principle. I, I believe many of you you know, go or went for this uh, management training, you know, uh, training how to manage people. And, and, you know. I, I think this teaching here in these words is a very key management principle for effective people management in team work development and also people relationship building. Let me explain that. Structurally, in organization, employees are always under the control, in the comma, under the control of employers. Why I say so? Because the employees' rights are only within the boundary of the HR policy, the HR handbook, the collective agreement, maybe if it's unionized, and the Employment Act. It's within that boundary, you are free. Beyond that boundary, you are governed by this legal thing, right? Uh, hence, the employer will always be the upper hand. That's why you call them the boss, right? So they, they decide. And employees will always be at their mercy, in the comma, the word mercy. So now you can see the similarity in the master and slave relationship, right? The master and slave is also under, just as I mentioned, the legal system. So now the legal system, it would be the HR policy, HR handbook, you know, our collective agreement, the Employment Act, and our boss, right? In, in, in Paul's time, it is the master's attitude and behavior. Remember I mentioned that. So we can see the similarity with that master and slave relationship and also employer-employee relationship. So in such a structure, 
It's very easy to slip into managing employees using a threatening, what I call a threatening approach or a bully approach to maximize employers' benefit. Sometimes you might hear a statement from the employer who says, okay, please complete it in two hours or you know, within this time frame, if not, you will be fired. <laughs> you know, statement like that. Yeah? Um, this will work against team spirit development because there is no mutual respect. Employers are to treat those under them well because they both had the same master in heaven with whom there is no partiality. The Lord will not say that you are employer or you are employee. The Lord will treat us equally, whether you are employer or employees. With that, I will try to draw some applications from that. Everything begins with our relationship to God. Jesus make it possible for us to have a restored relationship with God. That's where we can come today, you know, to worship the Lord because our relationship with God is restored. And with that restored relationship, we could transform our employer and employee relationship. If we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. In that, may I suggest three applications. Number one is that employees should be respectful to their employers and to seek to win them to Christ through their actions. Just now we sang, you know, during the worship, we sang that, you know, we want to show the world the love that God has shown to us, right? We want to bring people to God's kingdom. This is one of the very good opportunity for us to show that. And perhaps you might know, uh, the only Bible that the non-believers read is you, not the physical Bible. So your attitude and behavior at work should be a testimony for Christ and bringing people to Him, not to repulse them. I know sometimes it might be difficult to do, but this is the calling that God asks us to do, not with your own strength, but with the help of the Holy Spirit. Application number two, you may have a Christian boss. If so, I mean, that's good, yeah? If you have a Christian boss, the bosses will know, you know, your principles and your value. If so, do not take advantage of the mercy he shows. Do not think I can show up late because he will forgive me, you know? Yeah, so don't take that advantage, yeah? Uh, as, as I'm mentioning, in, in the morning, I, I was asking Richie, do you allow your people to come late, you know? He does, huh? So don't take advantage on him, yeah? <laughs> His goodness is not something to be exploited, yeah? So instead, be an even better and more diligent employees. Why? Because knowing that, it is a member of God's own family who is benefiting from your hard work. Right? So change with that attitude. Change with that attitude. Number three, each of us, no matter what position or authority we have, should remember that we have a higher authority in heaven. God will hold you accountable for how you treat the people under your care. Take note, because at the end of the day, we will have to make account to God, whether they are students, children, or employees. I, th I think it is um, very relevant for us to reflect this employer-employee relationship with a different perspective, which is what I call the biblical perspective. Okay, with that, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that as we understand what you want to teach us, we pray that, Lord, may it be not just be hate knowledge, but help us to apply that, to apply that in our workplace or in any situations that we are by, we have to report to people. Lord, help us 
that in this relationship, employer-employee relationship, your name will be glorified, that people will know you and be drawn to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let us rise to sing this last song together. You know, as uh, I was uh, listening to the sermon, I think it uh, relates to me a lot. Uh, for me being an employee, and, <laughs> and some of you uh, know me, uh, I recently also quit my job. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's something that, uh, that I was facing as well, a uh, burnout. And a lot of times, it's always uh, me. It's always me that I need to do. I need to complete this job. I need to finish this task. And often of times, we forget the honouring part. Often of times, we forget the God aspect. And yeah, it's just something that is so real and it's very hard to grasp sometimes. Sometimes you just have to come to God and surrender. So let's take this moment to reflect whether you're in school, college, or in the workforce. Or even retired, you know, just take this time to reflect. Take this time to reflect and see what God has in store for you when you rely on Him, when you honor Him in wherever you are. Sing, this is my desire. This is my desire to Jesus. Mm-hmm. 
give you my heart I give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm with Lord have your way in me And as the music plays, shall we just close our eyes In this posture of worship, we come before you, O Lord And Lord, as we have heard from you through the message, O Lord We want to thank you that you are part of our life, Lord that in us you work out your good plans and in our struggles and in our downside, O oh Lord, you are there. And as you speak to us and as you reveal your truth, O oh Lord, in our life, we ask, O oh Lord, that we are sensitive enough to hear you, to see you, O oh Lord. May not the busyness of the world take away our attention from what is important. May not the busyness in our life, in our work, take away the significance of what we are called to, O Lord. And as was shared, do we do it out of duty or do we do it out of service? And as an act of worship also, O Lord, we want to thank you for the hands and feet that have given us to work. And as we offer back not just our life, we also remember to offer back in tidings so that, Lord, you may use it to do great works in your kingdom, O Lord. So may I take this time also to pray for the offering that... Um, that we will bring before you, O Lord, that, Lord, you will use the offering for your kingdom's work. And church, if you are dropping by um, into the offering box, it is available behind and also to the left side of the sanctuary. And also, there's also option to do an e-transfer through the bank. Uh, details will be flashed out by the AV team. Therefore, Lord, in all this, we want to just praise you and thank you, O Lord. And as we close in service today, O Lord, we just ask that, Lord, as we move forth from this place, we move forth with renewed assurance, O Lord, with a renewed faith that you go before us, O Lord. And not just we go forth alone, we go forth with brothers and sisters that we have in this congregation. Help us to work in our CG, work in our uh, small groups, O oh Lord, that we encourage each and one to walk faithfully. And uh, really, O oh Lord, we just want to give our praise and thanks. All this we ask and pray, O oh Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless the Sunday, bless the week ahead.